You are watching Dissecting Disturbia. On June 19th, there was a rally held in Thunder Bay, Ontario at Resolute Paper Mill. This rally was to force the federal government into taking a harder look and a stronger stance on the softwood lumber disagreement that is happening between the United States and Canada. Here are some of the speeches and the interviews at this softwood lumber rally on June 19th, 2017. Okay, I'm talking to Bob Letter from the local 5025 Unifor. And uh, why are we here today, Bob? Well, we're here to have a rally in support of uh, a fair softwood lumber agreement uh, between Canada and the United States. And, I mean, uh, is this going to help our cause in the long run, or what, what do you think? Well, the, the primary purpose of this is that the federal government sees how important that the softwood lumber is to this country and how important it is to our economy, and it's about getting a fair deal that's part of NAFTA if they're going to renegotiate NAFTA. And do you think the federal government is listening right now? I mean, with all that's going on in the news and everything, do you think they're going to listen? Well, that's part of the objective of Unifor, and we're working with Resolute here today. Uh, there's protests right across this country, and uh, hopefully uh, the uh, politicians in Ottawa are paying attention to see just how important this industry is to this country as a whole. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Bob, and hopefully this works out well for you. Thank you for participating. Okay. Turn the microphone over to our Director of Forestry, Brother Mike Lambert. Brother Lambert. Thanks everyone. It's great to see that a number of people have come out. Of course, we always want this parking lot. We'd love to see it full and full of workers as it once was, and we want to keep it going. And we want to keep the momentum going. We want to make sure that Trudeau government knows that, yes, we appreciate the money and they're stepping up, but we want this to continue and we need to keep that pressure on. And we're going to need to do that back home in our communities when we leave here we can't just drop it drop it and say okay let somebody else do it we all need to get involved when you talk to a local councilman or a mayor or anybody else we were at the fcm we talked to a lot of people we got about 650 different councillors and mayors but we need to keep it up and it is starting the momentum in that, getting these resolutions passed and after you'll be able to pick up a book and if you can take that home with you we'd really appreciate it so with that, I'm going to introduce your first speaker, the CEO of Resolute, Richard Garneau. Thank you very much and good afternoon. So I think that uh, Unifor has welcomed a uh, dialogue uh, between Canada and the U.S. Uh, to, uh, to find a common ground for a long-term and durable solution on the market-based wood costs. Resolute is also encouraged by that uh, dialogue and supports supports Minister Freeland in our efforts to have Ontario and Quebec forestry regime recognized as already market-based, fully justifying free access to the United States market. Let me outline briefly why I think that a return to free trade is an option and what we need to do together as employers, workers, unions, First Nation and local community leaders if uh, we are to achieve it. The role of the federal government is to defend Canadian interests against foreign attacks, such as this fifth investigation in our forest policies. This is no easy task and for at least three reasons. The first reason there is 10 forest policies in Canada and the federal government has to devise a solution acceptable to all province. The second reason is that the U.S. law allows the Coalition for Fair Lumber Imports it's the, in the U.S. to complain repeatedly about our forest policies and practices as being unfair, even if even if Canada has been able to dem demonstrate time and again before independent tribunals that such accusations are not true. Canadian exporters of softwood lumber are not subsidized and they do not sell in the U.S. for less than it costs to make it in Canada. 
and they do not harm the U.S. competitors economically and financially. And the third reason, what the coalition wants is to reduce our share of the U.S. market in order to maintain higher prices above all for standing timber, but also for lumber. And guess who is paying for that? It's the consumer. And their main weapon has been financial pressure. The huge amounts of money that, uh, that have to be deposited at the border before the complaints are decided by uh, an independent tribunals have led Canadian exporter to come for some, but not all, reluctant, reluctantly to the negotiating table where the full weight of the U.S. can be brought to deliver a deal for the Coalition for Fair Lumber. One way to avoid this trap is for the Canadian uh, government to send a clear signal to the U.S. authorities, to the Coalition for Fair Lumber Imports, that it will not allow such financial pressure to determine the outcome of the dispute. You know, the aid package announced by the federal government is a good first step in that direction one that we have been asking for since the beginning of the current attack. If there is to be a deal, we want it on the merits, not the capitulation, because we have been bled to death financially. I hope that it is clear to all concerned that such a package would not exist without the mobilization of employers, workers, unions and thank you to Unifor to do, to do it, First Nation and community leaders. The new U.S. administration trade policy, as you know, will have a more protectionist inclination. Still, out of a rather difficult way in which Mr. Trump has acted so far, there may be opportunities to change the, the status quo on number. Here are a few reasons why this may be possible. Mr. Trump wants the after renegotiate, uh, renegotiation to be done by the middle of next year. And uh, Wilbur Ross and uh, Mr. Lighthizer want issues like softwood lumber with Canada and sugar with Mexico dealt with before the NAFTA renegotiation. I think that these very tight deadline and the fact that the U.S. is the demander on this one gives us gives Canada a rare opportunity to push for a more patent solution, one that avoids simply giving in to the coalition. As I just mentioned, the deal has to take into account the interests of all province. Ontario and Quebec have been especially audited by the last deal, with mill closures and thousands of job loss. Remember Atikokan and Ignez? where we now employ about 700 people were closed permanently. Both Ontario and Quebec already have market-based pricing for their timber, and this has to be recognized as an essential element of any future deal. Canada has to avoid also to negotiate with itself, trying to devise solutions that might be acceptable for the Coalition for Fair Lumber Imports. We have to set our sights higher and aim for free trade. For instance, Canada should not accept as a starting point for a deal the preliminary determination of a 20% subsidy rate because we know that this preliminary determination are always, always inflated as a mean to get us to the negotiation table we have been able to beat back this type of nonsense in the past through legal means using the U.S. law. <laughs> Paying a, a monetary ransom, as Canada did in 2006, by leaving a billion, yes, one billion dollars of industry deposit on the table is simply unacceptable. Together, together, we can make this happen. None of us, government, employers, workers, union, First Nation, and local communities can do it without all the others. So it is my message, and thank you again to Unifor to have organized that. Thank you.
Thanks, Mike. I'd like to start by uh, first acknowledging the fact that we're at the Fort Williams First Nations land and uh, I appreciate that. I also want to thank uh, Richard and Resolute for participating with us today. Um, and I especially want to thank the uniform members from across the Ontario who are here today. We have, we have workers from across Ontario that, that took the time to come here as well as non-forestry workers that are here from Thunder Bay. I want to thank them. It's a historic day. This is a very historic day. It's the first time that I know of that you, employers, government and unions are all speaking the same voice for forestry workers in this country. And that's an historical first and it's being done because Unifor and others are, are standing up for that. You see steel workers are here. This affects everybody in our communities. So, so why are we here? The countervailing duties were announced in the U.S. in May and they were an aggressive and unfair penalty on the Canadian forest industry. Later this week, we're going to face another duty. The anti-dumping duties are going to come in and many employers are going to be faced with up to 30, above 30% duties on softwood lumber. If we leave this unchecked and do nothing about it, it's going to affect thousands of jobs in Canada. Our estimations, which we think are low, is 25,000 jobs are at risk today based on the duties that exist. That's 10,000 direct forestry jobs and 15,000 indirect jobs. More importantly, 650 communities in this country directly uh, directly rely on softwood lumber and forestry jobs to, to subsidize their communities. These layoffs would be detrimental for the communities that they come from. So the decision to impose penalties on softwood lumber exports has nothing to do with workers. It has nothing to do with the fact that there's unfair penalties. It has everything to do with the fact that the private landholders in the states want to pad their pockets. That's all it has to do with. For more than 30 years we have faced American lobbyists to try and undermine our domestic industry. And it's shameful and it's wrong. Every single time we've been in front of an international trade organization or tribunal, Canada has been shown that we are not subsidized. Nowhere in this country is there any subsidies, any illegal subsidies on how we do that. So these bogus claims on our softwood lumber industry are completely and utterly going to kill the industry if we do not do anything about it. And what's the impact of that? Six billion dollars worth of softwood goes into the United States right now. They can only achieve two-thirds of what they need for their lumber. So the, re the, the truth is the United States is more reliant on our softwood than we are reliant on the United States. And we need to see, send a clear message to everybody that we're going to negotiate a strong and healthy fair trade agreement with the United States and we're not going to get bullied. So I, I talked briefly about the impact on the community but I don't think people understand how important the forest industry is in this country. It's the third largest export in this country right behind auto and energy. It employs over 200,000 people more than auto and industry in the country. That includes 45,000 jobs here in the province of Ontario. Forestry workers across this country put in 12, over $12 billion into the wider economy. And in fact, over 90,000 other jobs in the broader economy rely on Ontario's forest industry. So we can see that softwood lumber is a dispute that broadens the entire province and the country, not just in Thunder Bay. So our union has been working non-stop for the last four months, building a national campaign to make forestry and softwood the most important campaign in this country and we've decided that we needed to be the voice on trade and in particular on softwood in March local representatives that are here today and across the country went to, to went to Ottawa and they lobbied our, our government about the fact that they needed to have a fair trade agreement and they needed to, to negotiate from a power of strength a position of strength sorry earlier this month we were in front of the municipalities doing the exact same thing and we've followed it up now with this demonstration across the country. As Roly said, we're across the entire country making forestry an important issue. Our national president, Jerry Dias, who would love to have been here and is a better speaker than I'll ever be, <laughs> would, uh, unfortunately had to be in, uh, in Europe this week, has met with the prime minister and he's actually taken it to the, uh, the United States as well. We met with Wilbur Ross 
uh, about three weeks ago and I'm meeting with Wilbur Ross senior policy advisors again tomorrow. We're not taking this lightly and we are we are taking this negotiations to, to both parties, the countries, Canada and the United States. We are going to make sure that our message, workers' me message, communities' messages are heard loud and clear. Yeah. And the, fe the federal government is listening. They've ponied up almost a billion dollars, unheard of. And almost all of that money has been allocated to things that we've asked for, to help with EI, to deal with uh, the fact that there has to be loan guarantees, which they're working on figuring out how they can do that. So that's an unprecedented support for the industry. And they know we're not done. If this thing continues to go on, we're going to come and ask for more from the government. But Richard said this, and it's a clear message that everybody has to get clear. The most important thing our government can do is negotiate a fair trade agreement as quickly as possible. There is no reason why this has to take years and years and years. Everybody knows how to negotiate a fair deal, and they need to do it, and they need to negotiate from a position of strength. <clears throat> so in closing, I want to acknowledge the fact that there's workers from everywhere, but up on the stage, there's three young workers here, three young forestry workers. 30 years ago, I started in a mill similar to this in British Columbia. You see the fact that when I, when I started in the former organization, the CEP, we had 75,000 forestry workers in that union. We have 24,000 now in, this, in Unifor. That shows you the devastation that has happened through the years because of the softwood lumber agreement and what this industry has faced. We need a fair trade agreement that makes sense for everybody, for both countries to ensure that these young workers can finish their career in this industry. Because it's the most renewable industry in the country, and it's got a future in this country, and it's an industry that we should be supporting. You see the importance that it brings to our economy, and we, we cannot let it go down. So I'm asking all of you, take our booklets, and take this message, and don't stop. Because as soon as we stop talking to our politicians, municipal, federal, provincial, they need to know the importance of this deal and, how, and the importance that this deal is done fairly for workers. So take our stuff and don't let our voice stop because Unifor isn't going to stop talking and we need you guys, our members, and the communities to, to rally around us to make a fair deal. Thank you. Yeah. Woo! I bring greetings from Jason Lacco. He's our rep out of the 1-2010 out of Thunder Bay and Guy Borgoyne, who's our uh, president of 1-2010. We have about 3,000 members in the area from the Manitoba border. Uh, to basically Sudbury. We've got about 12 plants uh, and basically a couple of just restarted like White River, Horde Payne. We still got some plants down like Nakina and Duberville and whatnot. And th this whole softwood, uh, you know, uh, lumber dispute is, is hurting us. And we're in negotiations right now at the Terrace Bay Pulp. As we know, that came out of the raised out of the ashes with the Avia Burla. We're at the table now talking about fiber costs and whatnot and what type of uncertainty that brings to us. I know some of the statistics have been quoted here that there's 650 communities, about half of those are 50% or more dependent on, on softwood in our particular area. All basically our small towns and our areas are out of that 50% category where we're really reliant. Without the mills, without Terrace Bay Pulp, without White River, there is no towns. This is a social fabric of a community of Northwestern Ontario. I'm born and raised in, in this area and this is critically important. Your, your earlier speaker said, you know, he didn't quite get it right. It's not a shitty deal. It's an effing shitty deal. We're being used as a political pawns in a game here, and we shouldn't put up for it for one, one second. And the Trumpism and whatnot that's taking place here, think about it. Get active. Talk to your neighbors. Talk to your co-workers. Talk to your family members. Talk to the politicians. Make sure they have our message and our best interests at heart. This is critical for ourselves. Our jobs are on the line here. We need to stand up and fight back. And I can assure you, we've been down to Washington as well. We're going to try, we're in our area, at least we met with some uniform representatives. We're going to continue to fight and make sure that we're doing this in unison. We've got to win this. It's unfair. It's unjust. And we've got to, we've got to make sure that the, the politicians and the decision makers know this. Offering support and, and uh, whatnot and money after the fact isn't going to do it. We need to head this off the pass and make sure that when we're at the table. We have a strong voice, a fair voice, and that we get a good deal out of this and we make things right. Thank you very much. Yeah.